Good evening and welcome everybody. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes to make sure everyone who's joining today can finish logging into this call. I think we're ready to go. Welcome to this East West Railway Company online public event for Clapham Green and the Everstons, focusing on the West. My name is Claire Keith Anderson, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at East West Railway Company. Following the launch of the second round of non-statutory consultation on the 31st of March, we held a second round of online events or webinars last week, and this evening's event is the last of these. The focus of this evening's session is on responding to the questions raised by communities to date. For those wanting more detailed dialogue with specialists from the project team, please attend any of our live chat events. There are two to three sessions per week, eight in total between now and the end of the consultation. This evening, we will start with a quick run through of what we're consulting on, but the focus of this evening's event is on responding to questions raised to date by yourselves. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to the rest of the team. Joining us today, we also have our Program Delivery Director, Ian Parker, our Program Director for CS3, Jeff Lethick, our Land and Property Manager, Jörn Pace, and Nick Mitchard, Environment Lead for Arup, our Environmental Consultants. We also have James and Hannah behind the scenes helping us this evening. Before we start the presentation, I'm going to run through a brief housekeeping and Teams Live note. Many of you might be familiar with Teams Live, but just as a reminder, you'll be on mute throughout. Please note that we are recording these sessions and therefore will not reference any names or description, descriptions we've been given for GDPR reasons. That's all the housekeeping we have. Over to you now, Ian. Many thanks. Hi there. Th thanks, Claire. Um, so my name is Ian Parker. I'm the uh, Programme Delivery Director for East West Rail. Um, my responsibility in the in the programme is to, uh, to, to, to supervise the design and ensure that the scheme gets built uh, in accordance with that design. Um, so thanks, thanks for joining us this evening uh, for this joining us on this webinar. Um, this evening we're going to focus, uh, as you'll know, hopefully on section what we refer to as section D, which is uh, the section between Clapham Green, uh, Clapham Green, sorry, couldn't get that out, uh, and the evidence. Um, and the webinar is going to provide uh, information around the consultation and, and a quick recap of the proposals. Um, but but mainly what we're trying to do this evening is to focus on specific issues uh, and themes and questions that we've heard since we started the consultation uh, at the end of March. Um, it, in the past, you know, pre-COVID, we would have held face-to-face -face community events where we'd speak to you in person individually and answer all of your questions. But of course, um, because of the circumstances, that's just not possible. Um, and so for, for tonight, We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. We've we've grouped questions together that have already been raised, um, and hopefully we'll cover some of the biggest um, emerging issues that have uh, developed during the during the last few weeks. Um, I, I know that lots of people will have specific questions and further questions after they've heard what we have to say tonight. Um, and and if you need to to submit those questions, as Claire just said, we are running some live uh, live chat uh, public events. We've already run seven of these. We've got, I think, another eight between now and the end of the consultation. They're two hour sessions, they're live sessions where, um, where, where anybody can, can log in and engage with our team uh, and ask, ask specific questions that are relevant to you. Um, and actually all you need to do to visit any of these virt virtual consultation rooms and open the, uh, the chat box function, it will take you directly to uh, to one of our chats at the appropriate times and, and a member or several members usually of the East West Rail team. Um, and, and if you can't do that, if you can't alive, uh, attend a live chat event, then you can still email us. Um, the email address 
uh, is contact at eastwestrail.co.uk and we'll then try and reply to you as soon as we can. Um, so whilst we expect to take the full hour this evening to answer questions, uh, if we do finish early for one reason or another and there's time to answer some of your questions, um, please continue to submit them. I know there are some questions already in our in our chat. Uh, keep sending them through and, and obviously we'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, that just will summarise um, where what we're intending to cover tonight. Firstly, we'll we'll give you a quick recap on what we're consulting on. Um, secondly, and this is the biggest part of the session really, we'll focus on answering your questions, as many as we can get through. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk, talk a little bit more about uh, just reinforcing what I've just said really, how you can get involved and, and then what's next. So um, what's East West Rail? So it, you'll obviously have read uh, some of our information online and I'm sure you'll be aware that what we're proposing is a, is, is a new rail link uh, which connects communities between Oxford, Milton Keynes, Bedford, Camborne and, and Cambridge. Um, and you know the emphasis really is on connecting communities. It's not about how we can get from Oxford to Cambridge as quickly as possible. It's about how we can join communities along the way and that really is very much uh, the focus of this new railway line. Um, in terms of what we're consulting on, um, so on the next slide please, th this this consultation is an opportunity for you to share your thoughts on on the emerging proposals for the railway um, and and your views on the, the, the broader scheme really, some of which is already in construction of course. Um, the consultation document which um, hopefully you'll have found uh, on our website um, covers the following areas as you can see on this slide. So customer experience and railway operations and the proposed infrastructure development broken down um, into a number of into a number of sections, more of which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, just first of all, uh, dealing with customer experience. So on the next slide. Um, so we in parallel with consultation on the route itself, what we're what we're asking for feedback on is um, is is the customer experience and the railway operations that that we're planning to run. Um, it's important to us to to understand from a customer perspective what the what the railway can offer and ensure that we we tailor our proposal so that um, that we're meeting the needs of the, the greatest number of, of potential users of the railway going forward. Um, what we're consulting on are the 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 things that you can see in the, the sort of bullet points on the right of this slide. So um, we're consulting on the train service itself, how many trains we run um, and uh, where they stop. We're, we're then consulting on the, the station experience because what we want to understand is is, is what, what people need at railway stations um, before and after they, uh, they board their trains. Um, so what facilities are needed at the, at the railway stations, um, particularly for people with particular particular needs, um, like the people in the in the, uh, in the image here, where they have uh, small children to carry on and off trains. Um, we're then consulting on the on-train experience because East West Rail Company, of course, is responsible not just for for building this railway but for operating it as well. Um, so we need to understand what what experience you as potential customers are looking for whilst you're traveling on our trains um, and and then what type of interaction you need with with our customer service teams um, whilst whilst you're at our stations and traveling um, and then finally what what information is needed um, and and how you want to get that information whether physically or or electronically so just just moving on to um, to the main part of this presentation then. So this is the route, uh, the end to end route from Oxford to Cambridge. Um, the areas that we're consulting on primarily are, are those in the uh, in the coloured boxes. Um, the reason that the Oxford to Bicester se section is is shown here, of course, is because um, when we extend the railway further east, we do still have to go back and uh, uh, extend the work that we do. Uh, or that's been done already actually between Oxford and Bicester. Um, but primarily the, the focus of this consultation is on um, on the areas between Bletchley and Bedford and then from Bedford across to Cambridge uh, via Camborne. 
Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Jeff Leffick. Um, Jeff is our programme director for the section of the railway that runs from Bedford to Cambridge. Um, and he'll give you a bit more detail on the on the on the route options that we're looking at in that area. So, uh, Jeff, over to you, please. Thanks very Thanks. much, Ian. Um, so, as as Ian mentioned, um, we are uh, we are looking at what we call Section D, um, which is the the portion. So, the portion of Connection Stage Three, Connection Stage Three being from Bedford to Cambridge. Section D is the portion that goes from Clapham Green in the north of Bedford across to the Everstons. Um, we have um, we have five alignment options that, uh, that that we're that we're still considering um, of, of an original nine, um, and there are two emerging preferences, uh, um, which are route alignment one and route alignment nine. So route alignment one in this map is dark blue. And the realignment nine is the sort of purple color. Um, the, these 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 are not uh, these haven't been selected, but these these are the ones that we feel are most likely to to, uh, to to make it through to the final selection. There are a number of criteria that we use to 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 select the route alignments, um, and you can see that both of the alignments are running parallel to the to the new a428 scheme which um, which I was England is proposing um, r running along um, and it, what, what will what will be a, a transport corridor from uh, fr from St Neots area um, as far as Camborne so route alignment one um, it, you, as you can see comes across from from Bedford um, calls at Tempsford on the East Coast main line um, passes under the A428 um, to the east of that and then, and then um, runs alongside the A428 um, up to up to Camborne. And route alignment 9 is, uh, is very similar um, except that it's passing uh, at St Neots South um, before crossing the A1 at the Black Cat roundabout um, and then follows the, uh, the A428 cor corridor. Um, so, so in a nutshell, that's what we're going to be. We're, we're going to be talking about those two realignments over that stretch um, this evening. Now, you've asked a number of questions previously, and so we're going to go through those questions, um, and and we've grouped them together according to discipline. Um, and so the first group is is to do with alignment, um, and so I, I will I will um, I will answer those. Um, in case you um, are having a little trouble reading the screen, I'll, I'll read the I'll read the questions out first, and then um, and then I'll provide you with, with the answers. So the first question that was asked was that if you are aligning with the road developments, like with the A428 further east, then why don't you follow the A421 to Black Cat Roundabout? So following the A421. Um, it, it was actually um, was actually considered previously. It was part of what we called route option B. Um, now the alignments that we're looking at now, the five that remain, are, are in route option E. Uh, but route option B, um, we discounted this option in 2019. Um, the announcement of the of the final routes were, um, and and the uh, well the selected route option was announced in early 2020. Um, we align with roads when it makes sense to do so, and we don't do it just just for the sake of it. Um, now, the emerging the emerging preferences, as I as I mentioned just now, they follow the A428 up to Camber North um, because we're we're connecting with Camber North, and so it makes sense for us to 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 do that. Um, and there are synergies that we can find by by using a joint uh, transport corridor. Um, but looking at Bedford, um, connectivity with Bedford um, will give uh, opportunities for regeneration. And route option B would have taken the alignment um, to the south of Bedford, but by taking the alignment through the centre of Bedford, um, th 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 this provides a, a number of opportunities for regeneration um, um, and, and the, 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 that the more southerly route wouldn't be able to offer. And, you know, one of one of the primary reasons for building the railway is is not just to to increase connectivity, but also to create opportunities for the for the local economies. Um, also, you know, uh, the route option E is on flatter ground, 
environmentally, it, it, it's a it's a better option. Uh, I won't go into the environmental. That that's a separate section later. But um, you know, from an operational point of view, and also in terms of flat fill balance, um, it, it's a it, it's a it's a much more sustainable option. So these are some of the reasons why we did not uh, go with route option B, and we did go with route option E, um, and and the reason why we are not following A421 as far as Black Cat Roundabout. The second question, how will the viaduct proposed to run across the A6, Polo Radcliffe Way and Clapham Road be designed sensitively to match its historic surroundings? So this is, um, this is, a, this is a great question. Um, and of course, the, the, these roads are, are, are just in the north of Bedford, um, as many of you know. At this, at this stage in the design, we are, we are at the point where we can identify whether we need a cutting and embankment or a viaduct. We are not at the stage where we're actually designing the viaduct yet. Uh, but having said that, it is our intention to work the very highest levels in terms of uh, aesthetics. We we um, we will aim to uh, provide an aesthetically pleasing design um, for for these major structures and make sure that they fit appropriately into the surroundings um, and that sensitive to local conditions. Um, and 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 we we welcome um, suggestions that that you might make. So you can ask us questions, but you can also put forward proposals to us um, through this consultation process and we would we would encourage you to do so. We, we, we welcome your views on how this can be done um, and, and we'll use those to inform the next stage of the design. The third question, um, why in route alignments one, two and six are you running so close to Wilden High Street, ruining the whole village when you could go 50 metres further north and it would be much better for the village and you wouldn't need to CPO so many houses or be so close to them. So CPO stands for compulsory purchase order. So um, I think um, so. this is a great question. Um, and uh, but first I, I might, might just uh, clarify a few points here that aren't, aren't, aren't entirely accurate. Um, in, in fact, um, adjacent to Wilden, the, um, our alignment is is over 400 meters to to the north of the nearest building in Wilden High Street, and it's running through a cutting um, at the point that it passes the village. Um, there is no intention to compulsory purchase any properties, uh, any houses um, uh, along that section of the alignment, and certainly we will not be demolishing any houses uh, through that area. Having said that, um, I looked at the alignment uh, this afternoon in preparation for this uh, event. Um, we could go a little bit further north, I think, uh, than, than we are. Uh, we are running uh, a little bit close to two houses in particular. And if we move the alignment a little bit to the north, um, we could certainly ease that situation. So we will look at that very carefully um, at the next stage of design. Um, this, is a, this is a great observation. Um, you know, uh, this sort of local knowledge is extremely helpful to the design team um, to, to point out to us that there are alternatives to, to, to what we're proposing. So as we refine the design, we'll have a, we'll have a really good look at that um, to, to ensure that it is possible to move the alignment a bit further north, a little bit further away from Weldon. Um, you know, we, we, could well, we could well manage to, to be 500 metres away from Weldon High Street, for example. Um, the last question in this section, um, is there a further route alignment option to use the existing St. Neot station rather than build a new station to the south? What are the implications for current train services to London, etc., from existing St. Neot station if an additional station is built? Will trains stop at both? Will there be reduced services, etc.? Um, we we have looked at whether it would be possible to um, run the east-west rail alignment to the existing St. Neot station, but this would require demolishing a tremendous number of houses and other buildings, um, and um, it, it's really not not an option that that we we would we would do lightly. Um, alternatively, we could um, we could loop the track around and and join the east coast main line. Um, to use the existing station and then leave it again. But operationally, this is very com complex. And finding space on the East Coast Main Line to insert trains and get them out again is, 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 is very, very difficult. Um, so we are looking to cross um, 
to cross the East Coast Main Line um, more or less at right angles if, if we can. Um, and the and the emerging preferences which would have a station either in St. Neot South um, or in Tempsford. Um, there are no plans to change the services at St. Neot's um, and we're working with GTR and with Network Rail um, discussing the operations, uh, the future operations of, of the East Coast Main Line and how, how we can uh, insert um, our connector uh, in such a way that, that we have the, the least impact. Um, and it is certainly the intention uh, that in the future East Coast Mainline trains uh, would stop at both stations. Exactly what the configuration would be, I can't say today, um, but it is something we're looking at very, very closely. Right, so those are the questions that you had asked on alignment. Um, the next section is on environment, and I'll hand over to Nick um, to answer those. Brilliant, thanks, Jeff. Um, so uh, just to introduce myself, as, as um, I said at the beginning, my name's Nick Mitchard. Um, I work for Arup, and Arup are supporting East West Rail, uh, and I'm the environment lead on the project. Um, what I wanted to take you through is that environment is a is a key consideration in the design process. And the points on this slide are there to, to really serve to set out how those um, how those key principles guide both our strategic thinking and our implementation of how we how we undertake the design. Um, so just briefly, um, as as set out through government policy and legislation, um, net zero carbon is a fundamental um, consideration in the project both in terms of how we design, in terms of embedded carbon, how we will procure work in the future, but also how we will operate the trains and ensuring that we measure our net zero carbon from an end to end perspective. Um, committing to biodiversity net gain is again an emerging policy for national significant infrastructure projects and um, East West Rail are heavily committed to this and it has factored in part of our some of our design thinking about trying to avoid areas of priority habitats, but also how we can then use the route to enhance existing habitats and create new habitats and add value back to the communities. Um, as was mentioned before, a sensitive approach to developing route alignments. Um, our um, appraisals, which are set out in our technical report, describe how we've avoided uh, the most important environmental and heritage features along each of the routes, um, such things as listed buildings and triple SIs, but also how we've tried to balance uh, the environmental impact against the need for a design um, in the things like priority habitats um, and ensuring that we um, can integrate the scheme into the local landscape character and indeed the historic landscape character. Um, as will be discussed later, um, key to our design consideration is resilience and mitigating flood risk um, to ensure that the, the design standards we adopt um, align to the best um, practice climate change and considering climatic conditions within the design of the project, whether that be around um, how we minimise flood, how the levels across viaducts and um, under bridges to ensure we're designing to future standards. Next slide, please. Um, as again will be mentioned later, um, the use of sustainable energy for our trains. Um, although we've not yet made a commitment um, um, in order to electrify the railway, we will love in whatever design is taken forward, it will need to ensure it aligns with relevant policy and complies with legislation. Um, we have uh, last year and continuing to this year and we'll do so next year been, been undertaken an extensive program of surveying for protected species um, that extends to the colony of Barbersdale bats in Wimpole and Everston Woods, which we'll touch on shortly. Um, but it's also about broad, broader um, species as well. And those species will be really important uh, the findings from those surveys in the, to inform both the design and also any future environmental impact assessment which is undertaken. Um, given the nature of the route, it passing through um, large areas of rural land holdings, 
um, we've done a lot of work feeding into the design phase to try and understand what is the highest grade of agricultural land and where we can seeking to avoid it um, so as to reduce not just the uh, impacts on on land holdings but also on soil um, and finally thinking about impacts on communities whether those be impacts through visual impacts through noise through air quality or just more broadly amenity impacts and how we can um, both eliminate uh, and minimize those impacts or where those minimize sorry where those impacts do occur how we can put mitigation in place to ensure that we minimize any disruption next slide please thank you so following Jeff's lead, um, these are a number of questions on the environment um, taken from kind of broadly the most common themes. And I will also read out the question and then provide a response. Um, so the first question is, what about the environmental damage? Your preferred line is going through Clapham Woods. Well, what I'd like to say is that the project is aware of Clapham Woods. It's an area through um, work that we've done. We've identified as an area of potential ancient woodland and it and its ecological value. And as such, direct impacts to the woodland will be avoided. The route does not go directly through Clapham Woods. Um, however, the earthworks associated with the woodland are likely to be close to the woodland edge. And as we emerge through detailed design, we will need to consider the localised narrowing of those earthworks where feasible to maximise the offset between the scheme and the woodland. Um, but also very much in our mind is opportunities where we will seek to create additional woodland habitat in the vicinity, including to buffer and to further bolster the extent of the retained woodland. Next question is the proposed route entry from Bedford to Clapham Green contravenes Bedford Borough's own Greenbelt environment policy. Um, well, just to clarify this, the, the scheme does not impact on Greenbelt land within Bedford. Um, but where does this, if the scheme did impact um, uh, Greenbelt land in um, Cambridge, um, what we are proposing is that um, East West Rail will have to, as with this case with any scheme, will have to demonstrate to the Secretary of State why the building the railway counts as a very special circumstance, um, such as the case for the scheme as a nationally significant infrastructure project. At the next design stage, we will be considering how we can reduce not just the impact on the broader environment, but also the impact on the green belt both in the design of the railway and by, by proposing mitigation measures um, such as landscape integration. And finally, I think the point is that East West Rail um, Company are continuing to discuss with Bedford Borough Council um, any impacts that will be arising. Um, the next question is regarding the proposed wall of Clapham. The viaduct rail line is 15 metres above carriageway have noise contours been provided so we can understand the noise impact on local uh, residents? Well, uh, noise levels will be calculated for residential properties and indeed communities that are near the line, near the scheme, and those potential noise impacts will be reported both in the preliminary environmental impact report um, and then the environmental statement which will be submitted with the DCO. Um, Contained in those reports will be baseline noise levels and changes from construction activities and the running of trains will also be provided. So um, you'll be able to judge the, the, the change from the baseline in both construction and operation. Um, the final question is a is a repeat of the question uh, before which Jeff has provided an answer to, so I won't repeat that. Um, but thank you for listening. Um, I'll now hand over to Ian to take you through the plans for freight. OK, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, so just a couple of slides here on the, the, the freight issue. Um, and I know this is quite an emotive issue for a lot of people. And, and <clears throat> I know that you're keen to hear what our what our plans are uh, in relation, not just to the passenger service, which this railway is all about, but um, for freight as well. Um, so what what are our plans for freight? Um, so, you know, I guess the first thing to say is that 
rail freight is a is a very sustainable and quick way of moving goods and materials around the country. Um, it, it reduces CO2 emissions by by over three quarters compared to moving freight around by road and and obviously reduces congestion on the road network as well, both local roads and, and the national road network as, as, as well. Um, and it's safer. So moving freight around by train does take a lot of trucks off the road. Um, and it's been estimated that the rail freight contributes to the, the reduction of something like 600 casualties a year in terms of uh, road traffic accidents. Um, and, it, and of course, it brings benefits to the local and uh, national economy which have been estimated at, at, at over one and a half billion a year uh, in productivity gains uh, across the UK for, um, for, for UK uh, businesses. Um, so th that's just some background um, in terms of our plans for freight on this scheme. Um, so we've been set an objective by government uh, to support the, uh, the existing freight services on the route. Obviously, there isn't a route between Bedford and Cambridge, but um, between Bedford and Bletchley, um, the, rail, the Marsden Vale line does carry some freight traffic and our objective is to, to maintain uh, at least that level of service um, for, for freight on that line. Um, but we need to balance any benefits of freight um, and, and our obligations to government with, with your views. And um, as I said before, we appreciate freight's quite an emotive issue particularly when freight's running at night, and we'll, we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and we're in the middle of carrying out a study at the moment, actually, to, to just understand a bit more about um, what the demand is for freight, first of all, um, and, and really then what capacity there is on the line. So what we're looking at, as you can see down the right hand side here, are issues such as the available freight paths. So in fact, what we mean by that is First and foremost, this is a passenger railway. Um, there are a number of trains running per hour during the day, and there are some gaps between those trains, of course. Um, and what we're looking at is to see what can be accommodated in the gaps between passenger trains that um, that could be used for freight without, uh, frankly, without getting in the way of the passenger service. So what we don't want to do is reduce the um, the, the the level of service that we're providing to railway passengers. Yeah. Um, for the benefits of freight. So it very much is looking at what can be done between the existing passenger services. Um, at the same time, we need to understand whether there is a demand. We know that there is some freight which currently runs between Bletchley and Bedford. Um, of course, there is no freight between Bedford and Cambridge other than on the roads. Um, so we do need to understand what, what capacity we might need to support. Um, and we also need to understand what other infrastructure needs to be built. So it's not a lot of good in us saying, well, we can provide freight capacity on um, on this section of the route between Bedford and Cambridge. If in fact, uh, further east from Cambridge or further west than our section of the route, um, there's, a, there's a constraint which means that the traffic can't run anyway. Um, so we, we are looking more broadly than our scheme at what, what might need to be done to provide that capacity and what constraints there are at the moment. Obviously doing all of those things is way outside the scope of our scheme. Um, and we're also looking at the, the, the potential impact and how we can mitigate any negative impacts of, of freight running on this railway. So moving on to the next slide, there are there were two questions, or at least there have been several variations on the theme of these two questions. Um, but the two things that keep coming up time and again in your questions quite rightly really is uh, are the two the two that you see here um so the question the first one is what about overnight freight traffic um will will the railway be used outside normal passenger service hours to run freight um and just to be really clear about we're not envisaging that freight will run overnight on on this line it's just not part of the plan this is a passenger service we've been asked by government to accommodate some freight, some freight traffic, but um, only during our normal working hours. And our our plan is to run an 18-hour operating day, and we don't we don't therefore envisage that there would be freight, you know, at three o'clock in the morning or in the middle of the night. So, so our focus is on how can we accommodate freight within our existing timetable service, um, and which which 
brings me on really to the second question is it is it a passenger or a freight railway well a absolutely we're designing this as a as a passenger carrying railway um it's passenger services are what this railway is all about they're right at the heart of the, the project um and our objective from the department for transport is to provide an east-west public transport corridor um by providing rail links you know be between oxford and cambridge through the arc um and we don't want to compromise the passenger experience so the the last thing we would want to do is provide a service which is compromised by freight trains that slow down our service or cause delays or make it unreliable so so our focus very much is how do we create um, a reliable passenger service um so i'm going to hand over now to to Ian, who's going to talk about um the, the property issues associated with the railway and, and, and potential for compensation. So, uh, Ian, over to you, please. Thanks very Thanks much, for... Ian. So, good evening, good everyone. Evening. Um, my name is Jörn Pace. Um, I'm a London property manager at East West Rail, um, and I'm here to provide some information which is relevant for landowners. So, during this consultation period, uh, we've been meeting with landowners whose land could be potentially required for our proposals. And within these meetings, we've been able to explain the proposals further, um, the, the project timeframes, um, the statutory provisions which would be available to landowners and, and the next steps. And, um, and through speaking to the landowners and, and having these conversations with the wider community, um, the, the feedback that we gain from this also helps us understand the land use and how we can keep our negative impact as minimal as possible. Um, but on to the, the, the need to sell scheme, which we are consulting on. Um, we thank those who provided feedback on this to date. Uh, as a reminder for those who are not aware, um, this is a discretionary purchase scheme, which would provide support to those who have a pressing need to sell, but who are unable to um, due to our proposals and, and accept at a uh, substantially reduced rate. So, so in effect, you could apply for um, your property to be purchased at its unaffected market value rate, uh, providing you meet the, the criteria. And to, to answer some of the questions we've been receiving on this, uh, that there wouldn't be a set distance in which the scheme would apply. Um, and if introduced, it would be at the um, point of the preferred route alignment announcement, um, which is expected to be later this year. So we, we'd really value your feedback on this. Please do get in touch, you know, let us know if you think it's the right mitigation and if not, you know, what sort of um, support you would you would expect to see. Um, there's further information on this on our on our website. We, we have a section focused on land and property. Uh, there's a number of leaflets which um, summarise um, the need to sell scheme as well as other matters such as compulsory purchase, compensation and, uh, and blight. Um, and we have a team who can talk you through all of these. So please do get in touch for, um, via one of our contact channels or attend one of our live chat events where you can speak um, with, directly with one of our with one of our experts. Um, I believe we've now um, reached the stage of the um, of the webinar where we can actually kickstart the um, quest, question and, and answer session. So um, I will now hand over to James, who is going to be moderating that. Over to you, James. Thank you very much, Ian. Much appreciated. Um, so thank you to everyone who has submitted questions um, via the, the chat function. I'm delighted that we've, we've got some time to, to cover some of those. Um, the first question we've had in, um, I'd like to invite Ian to respond to if possible, which is, um, which is around um, funding and budgets, really. The, the, the question is, has budget been allocated to retain roads and public rights of way? And if so, what percentage will be retained? Um, Ian, would you be able to respond to that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I assume we mean what percentage of, of existing roads and rights away. Um, so look, um, our, we can't just close rights away, um, you know, to, to, to build a railway through. So first and foremost, our objective is, um, is that we retain all existing roads, uh, highways and, and, and other public rights of way. Um, and, and private accesses as well, because, you know, obviously a number of farmers have accesses, um, uh, tracks across the route that the railway will take. Um, and so we have to accommodate by one means or another, uh, all of those needs. What we won't be doing um, is creating new level crossings. There is a policy against that. 
um, and uh, so so in fact further further uh, to the west we, we're looking at uh, how we can close level crossings because there are rather a lot as you know um, so all of the crossings would be either um, depending on the topography really either above the railway or underneath the railway um, and there is budget for it that's part of the the scheme cost um, and so you know the the, the the focus will be um, what's the best solution. Um, of course, we'll look at the cost of, of the solutions, but um, but only with the intention of of coming up with a, a plan that um, uses public money wisely, but but provides the access. So quite simply, yes, we we have an obligation to uh, to, to maintain existing accesses. Okay. Thank you very much, Ian. That's great. Um, the next question we've, we've had in, I'd like to invite uh, Claire to respond to, if possible, please, which is, um, uh, it was mentioned in the beginning about, about the consultation and um, you know, we're doing obviously webinars, we're doing live chat events and lots of different ways to get involved, but we're not able to do face to face events. And um, we've had a question asking, why don't you extend the consultation so that you can have physical events? Um, thank you very much, James, and thank you very much to the person who asked that question. It's a really good question, and I have to say, I'm sure I can speak for everybody on this call. We would much prefer to be meeting with you face to face this evening. Um, unfortunately, we can't do that because of the current pandemic, but we have created a range of ways to reach our communities throughout this consultation. We have a summary of the full consultation that was sent to every address in the consultation zone and we have made every effort to reach out to communities through town and parish councils, local authorities, rail user groups and other organisations. We've also made it very easy to order printed versions of our consultation documents. So if you go to our website, you'll be able to do that over email, by using our free post address or over the phone and have sent copies of documents to elected representatives across the area to share with their communities. We welcome communities and residents to come to our virtual consultation room where we hold live chat events and our next one is going to be on Thursday the 20th of May, that's this Thursday, at 10 o'clock and each event lasts for two hours so from 10 to 12 but all of the events are listed on the website, so please do um, look on the website. Um, so our in-house experts will be lined up to speak with you. Um, through our innovative use of di digital technology, we believe that we will be possible, we're actually having, achieving a greater level of direct engagement this way with our team to more people than ever before. So we would really love to see you face to face, but I'm so sorry it's um, the current rules and we're not able to, but I signpost you to our website because there is actually a fact sheet all about our approach to COVID. And yes, thank you very much for attending this evening and thank you for your question. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, the next question we've got in, um, I'm going to invite Ian back if possible, and this is about um, power and traction, um, specifically around diesel. Um, I have heard news that the trains will be diesel. How will that com comply with these environmental policies? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, the, the the initial service that will be running from uh, from as far as Bletchley, this is on the section that's currently under construction uh, will initially be diesel. That's true. Um, and and that's because um, we, we have a railway service that needs to be put into into use very quickly. Um, but it's a temporary solution and and our focus is on what other solution might be right um, for, for the railway as a whole. And like, I mean, the, the government has already made a commitment to phase out diesel for trains. Um, over the next decade, so um, it is not our intention um, to provide a, a diesel service long term. It's an interim measure until we can construct the rest of the railway. Um, and, and at that time, we'll, we'll be looking at other options, which the, the most obvious of which is to is to electrify the railway uh, with overhead lines. That, that might well be the solution, actually. 
Um, but we are looking at other options as well, particularly looking at whether a combination of short sections of electrified line um, combined with battery powered trains is, is an option for us. So, um, so we're looking at alternative power sources. Um, and as I say, just to reinforce that diesel is not is not a long term option for us. It's a it's an interim solution so that we can start running a service at the, the western end of the of the of the line. OK. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, Jörn, we've had a question on, on land following um, your slide. Uh, I wonder if we could invite you to respond to this. Um, the question is, your need to sell scheme appears even less generous in its terms than HS2. Um, and what are you going to do to reassess your scheme against other examples and ensure that it is a best in class scheme? Yeah, thank, thank you, James. That's um, that's a, a very good question and um, and certainly the, the type of feedback we're after. So um, I mean, we, we do recognise that the need to sell scheme might not work for all, but um, we are at a, a very early stage and, and we are at the moment just um, consulting on it. So um, we'll continue to work with, with the DFT and um, and compare uh, the, the proposed schemes with, with um, those offered by other projects like HS2. But ultimately, you know, that, like I said, that's the sort of feedback we need um, people to return back. So, so please do kind of submit it formally and, and we'll consider that um, for, for the next round of consultation. So thank you. Back, back to you, James. That's great. Thanks very much, Jörn. And yes, just to reiterate, please do do share your views and, and, and use the feedback form provided. Um, we've got a, um, a question for Jeff here um, with regarding um, uh, uh, some of the topography. Uh, so the question is, considering how steeply the ground rises as the alignment runs through Clapham, could you consider a tunnel? I appreciate tunnels are expensive, but it would provide an absolute mitigation to some of the objections. Um, yeah, th uh, thanks, James. So we um, we are working through a value management scheme at the moment with our design team uh, to look generally at how we can lower the alignment um, because we appreciate that the current um, the current preliminary scheme um, is in in many ways it's a it's a worst case um, and uh, w which we've done so that we've got a, a very conservative starting point and then we look for ways to improve that um, so we are looking at a number of locations along the alignment to see whether we can lower the lower the alignment um, and and in some cases that means going into tunnel now specifically whether we can do it in this location um, I'm not I'm not in a position to answer tonight uh, but but be aware that we are we are looking at this very very closely um, I'll just make one other point um, a number of you I've, I've been watching the, the the chat bar and a number of you uh, spotted uh, that I had misspoken earlier when I was talking about the difference between um, Route option B and route option E, um, and I think I said that the uh, uh, that route, route option E was flatter than B, which of course it isn't. Um, the point was that um, if you the be the better balance of cut and fill that you have, which you tend to have in the hillier alignments, uh, in hillier places, um, it, it, the, the the more more environmentally friendly that is, because you're not moving material in or moving material out great distances. Um, you, you can balance that. Um, so I, I w wanted to, to clarify that and I do apologize for, for misspeaking. Thank you very much, Jeff. Much appreciated. Um, I'm just going through some of the other questions that we've had now. Um, we've got we've had a question in um, quite a specific one around whether we have a, a, a cutting or embankment at Brick Hill. Um, and um, it goes into quite a lot of detail. Uh, really, really grateful for, for you submitting this question and sending it in. Thank you. Um, I, I would say um, the best bet would be to ask that question um, to, to join our next live chat event um, or one of the eight live chat events between now and the end of consultation and speak to one of the technical um, uh, team in, in that section directly who, who'd be delighted to answer that question. Um, so thank you. Um, and then 
we've had a question um, with regard to, I think regeneration of Bedford was mentioned, and there've been a couple of questions asking um, whether we can explain um, what we mean by the regeneration of, of Bedford. And I wonder if Ian, whether you'd be able to provide a, a, a broad overview of, of some of those, uh, some of those yeah. uh, ideas. Okay. So, so look, um, it's not it's not East West Rail Company's objective to regenerate Bedford. Uh, to to just make that point, um, what what we intend to do in Bedford is improve the station to provide new platforms for the um, for for the East West Rail service. Um, and actually, what we're trying to do is to provide platforms which um, which keep the exist the, the existing railway, the Midland Main Line Railway, um, separate to the um, separate to the the East West Rail tracks, um, which is in the interests of 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 a more robust, reliable service. Really, um, so in terms of the regeneration of the the town, uh, and obviously Bedford, Bedford Council do have plans to uh, to regenerate parts of the town centre, um, and and we'll help them to the extent we can. Um, but only within the constraints of the, the project, which is to which is to to modify the station. So of course we will improve the station as part of the project. Um, it, it, the station will end up as a more modern um, and slightly larger station than it is today. Um, but in terms of our um, ability to work outside that corridor, we can only we, you know we we intend to submit a development consent application to to the planning inspectorate. Um, and we have to justify um, the land and property that we take purely on the basis of constructing a railway. We can't uh, we can't take land or property for anything else other than um, building the railway and and mitigating its effect. So we can take land for landscaping and that kind of thing. But what we can't do is is take other land for the purposes of wider regeneration. That's a matter for uh, Bedford Council. And for any of the other councils along the along the route, so that's our position, really. You know, the the, the land and property that um, that will become part of the railway land is is there purely to create a new railway. Um, but you know, having said all of that, um, it's really important that that the scheme that we deliver um, plays its part in improving local communities. So to that extent. Um, what what we aim to do is provide stations at locations where they'll have maximum benefit to the community, and of course, one of those is is in 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 the centre of Bedford. Okay. Thanks very much, Ian. That's great. Um, we've had um, a number of comments um, with regard to um, the the, the twenty nineteen um, uh, public consultation and then the twenty twenty announcement around. Um, route options um, where there were a number of uh, route options going south of, of Bedford um, and, 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 and bypassing the town as it were um, and then of course Prutee was was selected in 2020. We've had a number of comments um, asking um, why that was um, and, and what the purpose was. Uh, I don't know whether it is possible to, to to, to speak maybe about about this briefly, I suppose the first thing I'd say is that there's um, a heap of documentation online um, that that followed that uh, consultation process uh, that is available, uh, and I'd signpost to that. But but Ian, I don't know whether that it would be possible if there's any anything further you'd want to add to that with regard to um, uh, the, the 2019 consultation. Yeah. Okay. Um... Actually, before I do, and I will answer the question, but I, I see that there's another comment come up in the chat. Is is Bedford Council or private money going into rebuilding the station? Um, and just to answer that one, to the extent that it needs to be reconstructed to um, to accommodate East West Rail, um, it's it's government money that will be paying for it. Um, it'll be part of the part of the funding for this this project. Um, there might well be um, Bedford Council money going into the the broader regeneration around the station, but um, but East West Rail and therefore um, the the, um, the ultimately Treasury will will pay for the the cost of of improving the station to accommodate uh, to accommodate the railway. Um, so so just going to the the question that that you just read out, James. Um, so that we we considered a number of 
of options um, back in 2019. Um, and, and and as you say, there's a lot of information online uh, on our website, which which summarizes the outcome of that, that consultation process. Um, and the decision was taken then that on balance, the, the, the better route in terms of um, providing benefits and and providing a stronger economic case uh, was a route which which ran through Bedford and which um, is now known as option E. Um, and so we haven't looked again at option B at this stage. Um, we, we're not as we as we go through the process of developing the scheme. We're, we're, it's not our intention to reopen every decision that's been made along the way. And so um, so so we we are in this consultation looking at looking at alignments along along route option e, uh, route option e rather rather than reopening um, a, a discussion about further options so so it has been through a process of assessment um, using the same type of assessment criteria that we're using today um, and it was on the basis of that assessment that it was concluded that option e was the was the better choice of route for all sorts of reasons not just economics but um, the, the the 15 assessment criteria that that are summarised in a lot of our documents. Thank you very much, Ian. That's great. Um, I'm conscious of time. There is just one more question um, that I'd, I'd like to cover, if possible, which is again about land. So I'd like to invite um, Ian back, if possible, please. Uh, the question is: If you repossess properties around Bedford Station. Will you give any profits or overage back to the homeowners if you resell unused cleared land to developers? Um, if that's yep. something you might be able to cover. Yeah, well, well, I mean, James, we're being at the kind of very early stage we're at with the project. We we haven't been able to, to look into initiatives like this in detail. Um, I mean, and as Ian kind of pointed out a couple of questions ago, um, we'd always be looking to keep our land take to an absolute minimum and, and wouldn't want to be taking, well, we, we have a commitment not to take in any unnecessary land. So so really, it, it's early on in the, in the project, um, but it, again, it's the kind of thing that we will take on board and, and consider um, for, for later stages of the project. So the message is to um, respond using the feedback form and, and provide those kinds of ideas in in the feedback form that's great yes. thank you very thanks, much James. yeah I'm, con I'm conscious of the time so um uh, uh, i'll i think it's it's time for for claire to to wrap up so um thanks very much claire thanks very much james and thank you all very much for your questions so how you can get involved there are lots of different ways you can get involved so we've mentioned the virtual consultation rooms um, there's lots of information in there if you haven't already visited them, um, specific to your geographic location or to do with the customer experience and railway operations part of the consultation. So the live chat event function sits within the virtual consultation room. So again, we've mentioned those this evening. These are a real opportunity for you to have a dialogue, a discussion with experts. So please do look on the website find out when the next one is as I said the next one is on Thursday from 10 to 12 but we've got eight in total between now and the end of all the consultation so please come and join us if you haven't already joined us there we look forward to seeing you and to answering your questions we are very aware that there are um, many people in the community who aren't online and who don't feel comfortable in an online space. So this is our telephone number. And if you know anybody in this space, please reach out to them, give them a copy of the telephone number and encourage them to get in contact. We want to hear from everybody. Your views are really important to us. And yes, you'll see we've got a feedback form and we encourage you to share your views with us by the 9th of June when the consultation will close. Next slide, please. The slide hasn't changed on my um, screen, but basically it's just to say how you can respond to the consultation. I think um, the weather's having a bit of a, 
um, there are some gremlins, let's just say, I think, because of the weather at the moment. Um, how, how you can respond to the consultation. It's really, really important that we hear from you. Um, your feedback form can be submitted online by emailing us at consultation at eastwestrail.co.uk or send it by post to us at free post East West Rail. For further information or to request a paper copy of the form, please speak to a member of the team by emailing us at contact at eastwestrail.co.uk or calling us on our telephone number. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So what's next? Really, it's about keeping in touch. If you need more information, please drop us an email, look on our website, there's extensive information on there. And we really look forward to hearing from you. We've had some, um, a lot of responses already, but we want many, many more. So this is your chance to really inform the future of East West Rail. So thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for your questions and we look forward to hearing from you. And I'm going to say goodbye from the rest of the team and myself and I hope you have um, a very enjoyable rest of the evening. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye.